Alrighty, hello Facebook. We have Instagram and Facebook Live. It is Friday, April 24th, 2020. And uh, what's up, Cameron? What's up, Joel? Thanks for joining uh, for today's live stream, for today's uh, session where we're talking about whatever questions you guys have. So feel free to drop some in the chat. If you're watching on Facebook, drop them in YouTube if when you're watching the replay and uh, drop them in on Instagram if you're here. What's up, Luke? Uh, looking forward to you come, being uh, in Texas in the fall. Thanks, I'm glad you could, could come. Um, but we have uh, some questions that came in this week. Uh, let's see if I can get to them on Instagram. But whoops, I flipped around my screen by accident. Okay, so we have our questions here. Um, feel free to drop some in, but otherwise we're gonna go ahead and start answering some of these questions. Uh, so let's see, this is, this is a great question. This is from Brenda Person2. She says, uh, do you like sunny or rainy days? Uh, I'm definitely a sunny, sunny person. I thought I didn't care. Uh, and now as I get older, I know that I do care. And that I'm definitely much more of a sunny person than a rainy day person. Uh, rainy days are good for, uh, you know, now and again, trying to get some work done. But otherwise, I'm definitely a sunny day person. And luckily, uh, today, in, I'm in Texas today. And luckily, it's a sunny one here. So I uh, hope you all are having a good Friday so far. And uh, so we'll kick off the questions with that. But let's go back to our questions. I know there's some trombone music-related questions here. Uh, yes, there is. OK, so from Unrelease Dent, uh, he asks, or she asks, I'm not sure, uh, how does one develop a fuller sort of a more fat tone? Okay, so how do you get a better sound on the trombone is basically the, the question here. And uh, so the answer is do long tones and have a good sound concept. So that's kind of a quick way to say that uh, you have to have the sound of someone in your head in order to try to develop your own sound. So for me, I like to use a sound concept worksheet. We do this in our Jazz Fundamentals class at UNT. And we also, uh, I do it with my students in the virtual studio. We talk about, you know, what is the concept of a good sound? Why is one sound good and another sound not as good? Um, Jose Carl says pedal tones. That could be part of it, but pedal tones is not going to make you have a good sound. It's just going to make you good at pedal tones. So you got to have that concept. You got to have, um, you got to have a concept and then you got to try to do long tones and create that concept in real life. That's what I think. And so, but the best thing you can do, I always say this to students, um, Roy Hargrove used to say, you got to play long tones and still, until the room lights up. So uh, that's what I like to think about when, I'm, when I am uh, doing long tones. Get that concept, try to make that uh, sound as best you can. Uh, so that's the short answer. Do long tones every day. That's how you get a good sound, a big fat sound on the trombone. Um, Ryan Barsky, he's switching over to a Facebook question. He asks, how do you deal with writer's block? That's a good question. Um, yes, Jose, listen to car players that have a great sound. That's exactly right. I agree, 100% with you. So writer's block. Um, I'm not a person that necessarily gets writer's block that much because I have transitioned my compositional practice from more like only playing, only writing when I have something to write to making it into a practice, exactly that. So trying to carve out time every week, every day to just do uh, writing and to just be um, thinking about any sort of musical ideas, jotting them down that could be on the trombone, could be on the piano, it could be anything. Really. You gotta excuse the wild corona hair here. So it's been a while since I've been able to get a haircut. Um, but turning your, um, writing into a practice, not judging it, just writing stuff. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, whether you're going to use it or you're not going to use it. It doesn't really matter all that much when you turn it into a practice. And so I have a notebook. I was just working on something right before I jumped on here. I have a notebook, uh, like a moleskin notebook that just has different tune ideas. And they're not even tune ideas. They're just musical ideas that um, I use to eventually, maybe it'll be something, but I just try to make it a compositional practice and actually jump on every day and do the work. Um, so if you're having writer's block on a particular tune, I would just go write anything, literally anything. And writers do this, like people that write books and stuff. It's just like, I have to write a page. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be 
something that I'm going to use in this project that I'm working on, but I'm just going to write and I'm not going to judge and I'm just going to try to get into that state where ideas are flowing. So that's how I deal with writer's block. I try to get into a state where I'm flowing, uh, whether it's for that project or a different project and knowing that that process of writing is going to eventually translate into whatever it is that I'm trying to work on that I'm stuck on. So I hope that helps Ryan. Sorry that you're having writer's block if you are. Um, there's some really good questions that came in uh, this week, so I'm really glad. Oh, there's one that just came in here. Uh, let's see. Who are some of your favorite vocalists? This is from Zatch MC. Uh, I really like Nat King Cole. I really like Frank Sinatra um, in terms of jazz vocalists. I like how they deliver the song in a kind of un adulterated way they just play they just sing the melody for the most part and i and i really like that also about ella fitzgerald how she but she kind of makes it her own a little bit more uh sometimes not all the time but uh i like those people i like um uh their name is blanking to me i'm learned i'm glad there is you from her recording and it's really great and i'm blanking and it'll come back to me later on. But uh, I also like, you know, like Kurt Elling in terms of jazz vocals. Um, but I'm not the hugest vocal fan. I'm definitely more of an instrumental music fan. So uh, to say that it would to uh, say that I have a long list of favorite vocalists would probably be false. You know, there's some great new artists doing something. Michael Mayo is a great, amazing young vocalist. He does some great stuff. Um, I listen to some Becca Stevens is really great. I mean, there's a lot of great ones. There's a great uh, bassist that I know named Katie Ernst from Eastman, and she uh, plays and sings, and she does really great. She has a band called Twin Talk. That's a great, she's another great vocalist. Uh, so I'm not sure if I have too many favorites there, uh, but hopefully that gives you some to check out if you're listening. I definitely try to go to Sinatra and Nat King Cole when I'm trying to learn tunes, that's for sure. And also because they're in the trombone register, so you can kind of match, match them up. Uh, here's a question from Joel Earhart, Earhart, sorry if I mispronounce your name, says, do you ever feel unmotivated? And if so, how do you combat that? That's a great question. And I see this question um, to all the people that I watch on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I see the same question going to those people. And it's interesting, everybody has their own ways, but um, I'm so kind of motivated uh, by my big picture goals, by the, where I wanna get to in life, by, these like large ideas that I have that there's always something that I can work on. Even if it's the thing that I'm working on, I might be unmotivated about. So having like a lot of different projects that you're involved in and having like different things you can go to and jump back and forth so that when you feel like, oh, I'm, I can't do any more of this, you have something else that you're passionate about that you can go to is really important. Uh, I'm not a person that thinks you could just, just do one thing. I'm a person that has to do lots of things. So I like to have different projects I can go to when one feels like it's stagnant and um, in terms of like musical unmotivation i know this is a common question and a common uh issue that people come up with i go back to when i felt this way musically unmotivated when i was in grad school um, i was kind of like oh man i don't want to practice anymore i don't want to deal with all this whole school situation and a whole variety of things but uh, the thing, the way that I got through it was going back to my favorite records. My best friend, uh, one of my best friends for sure, uh, Joe McDonough, great trombonist. He teaches at Temple University now. Um, he and I were doing our masters at the same time at Juilliard, and he used to say, "Man, just go listen to your favorite records, and you're going to get inspired." And he was right. I went back and listened to some of my favorite records, like some Duke Ellington stuff that I really fell in love with, and Chick Corea, "Now He Sings, Now He Sobs," and some Herbie Hancock records, just a bunch of those things, the JJ records that are just kind of classic in my book, things that I really you know, can never get away from, these JJ records, um, just all that stuff. So go listen to music if you're feeling musically uninspired. Listen to your favorite stuff and let it just flow through you and uh, know that it's part of the process. Being unmotiva unmotivated is how you get motivated in the long run, so don't be too discouraged by having those feelings. Uh, what's up? I see a hello from Origin. And uh, we are taking live questions. If you are just joining us now and you want to uh, chat, feel free to uh, drop some questions in. Uh, we're happy to 
answer some live. We have some pre-recorded questions from this week. And I'm really glad that you're here. I hope you're having a great Friday. It's Friday the 24th, if you're watching this later. Um, so that's my question of motivation. But here's another. This is going to be a very trombone-specific question here. Uh, Benja Storm, he says, how does your articulation change depending on range, legato, fast playing, and how do you work on it? Okay, that's a good question. And kind of a long answer, probably. So I apologize in advance for this long answer. But okay, how does your articulation change based on range? So I'm going to have to break this down into these different areas because uh, range wise, you have to change, or at least this is how I've learned to do it and how I found mo the most success is changing the vowel shape as you ascend. So meaning that you have to Go E as you go up, A ah, and O as you go down. So if I'm playing an ascending line, the tongue lifts in the back of the mouth as you go A E A E A E. So as you go A E A E A E, and so when you go into that register, making sure that it's the, it's not just pushing more air from the diaphragm; it's actually compressing the shape of the mouth, the inside of the mouth, with your tongue to get the air to move faster and to get the air to move more um, concentrated, more. Uh, narrow and getting it moving to so get into that upper register. So changing that. So going ta 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 If you go lower, ta 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 to 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 to. And so to a e as you go in those different registers. So if you're playing in different registers, you got to change the articulation. We were just talking about this with some students yesterday, having some struggles hitting some high notes in an etude, and it's like, what vowel sound are you using? And uh, it turned out he was using a ta when really we needed a T, so if that makes sense. So for legato, the syllables don't change. You just need to move the slide faster than when you're playing non-legato. Uh, and the saying for legato is move faster, stay longer. That's how you get smooth playing. You move this slide super duper fast, and then you um, go ahead and... <sighs> Just make it as smooth as you can, you know. Da 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 da. You want to make sure that everything is as smooth as you can in terms of the approach, the vowel sound that you're using, da instead of ta. But I pretty much use as a rule, whatever, however I would say it. That's how I want to articulate it when I play. So if it's ta 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 or do 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 do, I'm going to use that articulation style that I would say when I play. So. Uh, that's the best one uh, that I can recommend is saying how you would play it. Uh, for fast playing, I do multiple tonguing and I do a double tongue rather than a um, rather than a doodle. Sorry, blank blank there for a second. Uh, I don't doodle tongue. I double tongue. I do some doodle. If I go like I prescribe to the same idea of say it and then play it the way that you would say it. And just like, you know, Wycliffe Gordon has a great method, a great book called Sing It First. You know, they're talking about singing pitches and hearing pitches in your head, which is super important and uh, allows you to really play more of what's in your brain rather than just playing by rote and meaning like patterns and things that you've learned. So connecting your ear, connecting what you say to how you play is really, really super important. So that's how I do it. I know that was a long answer uh, to this question, Ben just storm, but uh, hopefully that helps you. Um, Alexander, we're switching over from Instagram to Facebook. Uh, let's see, Alexander says, stay safe. Hey, thanks for being here, appreciate that. Uh, and we're gonna go to the next question, which is over here on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, hopefully you can see this and adding it. All right, he says, hey Nick, loved your solo on your track, The Guru from your new album question. Who should I check out for transcribing solos? I'm still new to transcription, I'm not very good at it yet. Well, start simple. Um, make go with things that are super clear and super um super clear and super simple well i don't know in the register of the trombone not impossible stuff so sometimes people go to the guitar or piano and all that stuff makes shapes they play intervals that are really hard to play on piano so i go to jj johnson i go to miles davis early miles davis kind of blue miles davis the solo on so what is a good one to start with if you're just starting out transcription it's super clear it's in one mode you don't have to guess uh, you can basically uh, 
intuit what notes are going to be used based on the mode, that Dorian mode. Uh, so I would suggest going to Miles Davis So What. I would go to Curtis Blue Train, Curtis Fuller on Blue Train. I would leave out the fast part. Uh, there's a really fast double time part, but don't worry about that part. Just play everything else. Uh, and then I would go to some J.J. Johnson. I would go to Lester Young, Lester Leaps In, some I don't know, rhythm changes, simple solo. I would go to um, uh, uh, Hank Mobley. Hank Mobley plays some real clear stuff. His solo on Remember is really good from Soul Station. Just the first chorus for trombone, he kind of gets a little crazy after that, a little uh, too busy for us as beginning transcribers. Uh, so you got to pick stuff that where you're going to have uh, success, easy success early on so that you feel like you want to keep on going and it's going to be slow and it's going to be hard but don't give up okay blake don't give up you got to keep transcribing that's the only way to get uh the style the notes the harmony the phrasing the swing it all comes from doing that transcribing and then trying to match exactly and play along with uh your your favorites you know and your technique will start to improve to be able to execute the things that you're hearing because they're in your brain instead of just this abstract thing that this person plays that you really like. So I uh, hope that answers your question. Hope you can um, get some of that going for yourself, Blake. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you asking a question. Uh, all right, so we're going back to Instagram for some more questions. Feel free to drop one in if you're watching live. We have a couple more questions here. Uh, um, somebody, this is some kind of troll, but it's a nice positive trolling says random but tell someone you love them so mom i love you thanks for being a great mom all right next question uh from trevor F Furman. trevor oh this is glitching out that's not the, not what he asked he had a question where is it i think it's glitching out a little bit on me okay here's a question from henry b jazz I see a question right here. Uh, I'll make sure I get to this one. So, Gers, you're next. Uh, Henry B's question, thoughts on learning standards in all 12 keys. So I think that it's important to learn a few standards in 12 keys because it opens up your ears, number one, and it increases your harmonic flexibility. I know that's a weird thing to say, but harmonic flexibility allows you to hear ideas in different keys because when you play Cherokee in B, it sounds different than when it sounds in C and D flat and D. So everything lays different on the trombone. So we have our students, I have my students do maybe two or three a semester that go through the keys. Uh, some Just to start getting the sounds of other keys in your head and playing it on familiar keys, getting familiar with the slide positions and all that stuff. Um, I don't think you need to take every song into every key personally. Uh, also, it's not my strength. So other people would say you should learn every song and every key. I think you should learn to play a few songs really well in 12 keys instead of just glossing over every song in 12 keys because it's a lot of work. Um, it's a huge amount of work, uh, if especially at first. So I think it's important. Take simple songs through keys, and then as you work your way up, eventually get to taking bebop tunes through 12 keys. It's a great, 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 great learning experience. A lot of people that I look up to have talked about learning Donna Lee in 12 keys, and that was a huge uh, thing for them. And it was a, a huge uh, place of improvement, improvement uh, a huge place, uh, place of growth for them. Um, so yeah. So, okay, Gers, your question. Greetings from Mexico. What's up from Mexico? How do you play a better way or your recommendation for the double articulation? So he's talking about double tonguing so I go do 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 and the most important part of that is the G syllable, the back end, the backside, the go 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 part. So you've got to practice just the G. You've got to practice go 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 and get it nice and even so you can match the front and back of the articulation together. So do go do go do go do go do go do go do has the same weight on the D and the G syllable. Do go do go do go do go do, and then you got to get it do go 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 do uh, so there's a question from Gers. We did Henry B. That's a great question about 12 keys. Uh, and I'm going back over to Facebook here and put this question on the on the screen. 
from Michael Clement. What's up, Michael? Uh, he says, what's your current lighting setup? Well, I'm set up right next to a window. So no, first of all, there's a bunch of natural light coming in from this direction. Here's the window over straight that way. And I have set up just my Canon ADD that's pointing at me, connected to the computer. Uh, it took a, while, a little bit to kind of figure out how to get all this set up, but um, yeah. And I also have just a desk lamp with a LED light bulb right here to create some light on the wall. I watch some YouTube videos on lighting and they'll tell you that you need a three point lighting system. And so I don't really have a three point lighting system. I just have the window, this lamp and a light that's in the room back here that kind of is the backlight or fill light. But uh, I know, very interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, but feel free to drop in some questions. I got a few more that we've saved up from this week. Appreciate you being here. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, a spammer, more spam. Do you like motivation? DM me for the answer. All right, here's a real question. How do you absorb the jazz language? That is a great question. So how do you absorb the jazz language? I think you absorb it from listening and experiencing. So it's one of those things where you have to play along with records. You have to play along with the players that you like, not just in transcription mode, but also in just like playing music mode. You know, so like if you're a drummer, for example, playing along with drummers that, um, uh, records that have no drum drums on them. Like I, I've been learning drums and I've been playing along with, um, there's a bird record with Roy Hargrove, uh, Stephen Scott and Christian McBride bird, uh, bird. I forget what it's called, but um, it's really great because you can play along with these masters and try to get your feel to match up with their feel. And so the same thing with trombone. So if you're playing along transcriptions, if you're playing along um, just tunes, like with great rhythm sections, you know, you can solo over that instead of using Jamie Abersold or I Real B. I like to react in real time to different versions of songs or different songs in different key, like they're in different keys for different singers. And so that's how you absorb the feeling of jazz is by Mike, by digging super duper deep into um, super duper deep into these recordings, matching the, the eighth notes, matching the style, matching the articulation, matching the flow. That's the, that playing along of transcriptions is the only way in my book that you find how to swing and how to flow and how to play jazz. And then you got to go and experience it live. You got to go to jam sessions. You got to play and get cut. And then you got to like figure it out. And you got to play with your friends who are dealing with the same issues and talk, talk about it. And how do we get better at this? How do we play these this music? And how do we play these eighth notes? And how do we play this vocabulary? And where do the accents go? And then you got to find yourself a great mentor, a great teacher. Uh, you have to find someone that can show you, you know, for me, that was Wycliffe Gordon and Steve Teray, like in our lessons, we'd be like, no, that's not how you do it. You do it like this and he would show you. And it's, that's the tradition of jazz. You have to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody. It doesn't have to be the biggest star. It can, it just needs to be someone that knows what they're doing and can kind of show you the ropes, say, Hey, transcribe this, check this out, all that kind of stuff. So I uh, highly, highly recommend doing that, but that's how you, absorb the jazz language to get back to uh, Lisa's question. Um, so thanks for the question, Lisa. I see one on Facebook. I'm going to kind of put this here. Um, Josh Cassette. Hey, Josh, what's happening? Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Can't wait to hear you. I'm not going to play on this live stream. Sorry, Josh. Uh, I'm going to, um, I, I usually do play, I do playing on on Thursdays, I'm trying to, you know, segment the content, give something different on different days. So Thursdays, if you didn't know, we do a live play along where we're, do, we're trading, trading over tunes. So I use a, I play the play alongs through the stream and then we go back and forth and I call them out. We did bird tunes this week. Next week, I think we're going to do monk tunes. So if you want to tune in for that, that's on Thursday at uh, one o'clock Eastern time. No, 12 o'clock noon, 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 and uh, noon on Thursdays and then Friday afternoons, 2.15 Eastern time uh, for these Q&A sessions. Um, yes, Josh, that is a great. Yeah, Parker's Mood, that's the name of it. Thank you for that. So Josh has a question, he says, what suggestions would you have to incorporate bebop language into big band writing without it sounding so weighed down? Oh, that's a good question. Have you checked out the Tad Dameron big band stuff? That's got bebop stuff all over it also all of the dizzy gillespie big band stuff i would listen to um i would listen to those things uh the orchestration is kind of the 
the uh, key to the success of the bebop, bebop style. And you gotta have players that can handle it. Just writing a bunch of bebop lines is not gonna yield a lot of success unless you have players that can execute it. So that's like, you know, one of the great reasons to be in New York is like you get all the players that can actually play that style, you know, that bebop style, because that's what uh, they've been studying for a long time. Uh, but in general, yeah, you got to listen to those records. Listen to the Jimmy Heath arrangements. Listen to Tad Dameron, Big Band. Listen to Dizzy Gillespie, um, United Nations Orchestra, and just see how they approach it because um, that's the best way. I can't tell you. You know, you know that's how you get the. You know, Josh, you got to listen and and then uh, take inspiration from that. So, orchestration, make it not too heavy. You know, don't put it too low. Don't put the bass trombone on the. Uh, fast eighth note lines if you don't want it to sound heavy you know just think about that don't give it to too many people you know listen to things to come you know the saxes have unison melody the, tr the trombones and trumpet have unison rhythm it's not too heavy and not too thick you know listen to those things and observe the orchestration as well as the actual notes because it's not so much about the notes it's about the um, way that it's orchestrated gil evans orchestrated a whole bunch of um bebop stuff like with cannonball adderley the record's called old bottle new wine um check that out they do like lester leaps in and donna lee and uh strutting with some barbecue and some, these tunes like this and they're all in a kind of a bebop style um so it's been done a lot of times different ways throughout the years so you can just listen to that and you will have a breakthrough i'm sure and then you just do it and then you figure out what doesn't work all right, a couple more questions from Instagram here from Higgins and Lisa, I see you. I will get you to you just in a sec. Uh, from Higgins, he says, how much do you have to change your solo mindset when switching to a different style of jazz? Hmm. I try not to switch my mindset ever. I always try to be in the mindset of playing the sound of the music that is happening. Uh, and what I mean by that is... Uh, if it's a bebop tune, play in a bebop style. If it's a modern jazz tune, like one of my tunes, I'm gonna play with more modern vocabulary. I'm gonna play with a more modern approach, whatever that means. And that I think bebop has a particular way of accents and a particular vocabulary and a particular type of chromaticism. Uh, and it's not too out necessarily. There's not a, lot, a whole lot of stretching of the harmonies. So playing the tune, basically, you know, people probably, you've heard people say like, play the tune, use the melody, play the changes, you know, you we wanna, make it sound like the tune we want to make it sound like an extension of the melody an extension of the harmony we, so i try to be in the moment of whatever the piece is so in that sense i'm never switching and always switching uh, so that means you have to learn vocabulary in those different styles and listen to those different styles uh, and i get a lot of influence from my friends and peers i play in lucas pino's nonet and he writes music and hears music in a kind of a similar way that I do, even though our music doesn't sound that much alike, or maybe it does depending on what you think. But um, you have to absorb it, you know, just like we're talking about absorbing the language of jazz in terms of specific vocabulary. We're also absorbing the language of jazz in terms of non specific notes, but the feel and the flow and the sound. And so that's what I think about is just, that's what Steve and I used to talk about a lot colors and sounds and how does it relate to the piece that you're playing whether you're playing round midnight or your own composition like you got to play the sound of the music that's happening so that goes back to something i've talked about a lot when i do these lives live streams or lessons or anything and just like posing to yourself the question what does the music need right now not what do i want to play what does the music need right now so if you're always thinking that you're always going to make decisions that are serving the music and it's going to make you a more musical player and I think more people will want to play with you. It's one thing to be killing and shredding and like play a million notes and be able to play over anything. But it's another thing to be able to do that and have a lot of musical awareness at the same time. That's what makes it tricky. But it's a journey. So just start listening to the different styles that you're being called on to play and that you want to play and start to learn them more deeply. Um, learn tunes by composers that you love that maybe someday you'd like to play with, whether it's Lucas or whether it's Herbie Hancock, you know, it's all the same. All right, another question I see here from Lisa, Liz Trombone. How do you handle doing live streams on several different platforms at once and then you upload to YouTube later? What's your process? 
yeah, I just, I feel like um, streaming on YouTube is a thing that people do. And I'm just deciding that I, I usually like to release a bunch of different content on my YouTube channel. Some of it related to playing and some of it's educational, some of it's business oriented. So uh, I find I could stream to that platform as well. Um, I do stream to the outside of music YouTube, um, but I just find there's more interaction for me on my channels if I stream on Facebook and Instagram than I do on YouTube. But when I post videos on YouTube, people can find them all the time. So I'm trying to create an archive at the same time of do lots of live interactive stuff. Um, so for me, that's that's why I just have decided to do it in this particular way. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm constantly switching it up and constantly trying to figure out how to do this better. And so I just started using a new program called Ecamm Live. You can see I'm using a trial. It's here on, on Facebook and will be on YouTube. You can see the little logo because uh, it's a trial version, seeing how it works. Uh, I use another website, website called Restream.io that allows you to go to multiple places at once. Uh, I'm still trying to get Twitter and LinkedIn to accept me so that it'll stream in those places. Uh, but I'm just going to continue to do it and continue to um, uh, continue to put it out. And so sometimes if I need a clip from Instagram, like if when uh, Ryan Truesdale was on a couple weeks ago, like I do have a screen recording app and I record the part that I need and then I can edit edit it together to upload it to YouTube later. So YouTube has the most editing. Everything else, everywhere else is kind of just the stream kind of goes out how it is. And uh, I think that's okay. I think if having different types of content and different levels of production is okay because uh, we're not we're not all uh you know cnn <laughs> i can only do so much so uh but i'm switching up equipment and all this different kind of stuff to just kind of find the best thing that works for me and my budget you know on uh, not an unlimited budget so i'm using what i have uh to make this happen I, there's a lot a lot of videos on youtube about different uh streaming stuff streaming setups so i would recommend doing that but the best thing you can do is get it set up get some lighting making sure you kind of make sure that things are well lit at least through you know natural light is as is, is good as anything else so uh, hopefully that answers your question lisa all right i've got a couple more here so ander texts you 121 says hello i would like to know what playing routine you have on a gig day especially if the gig is at night do you play in the morning when do you warm up? These kind of things. Um, I guess I don't. I don't differentiate a gig day from any other day. Um, I think you should be practicing enough that uh, it doesn't matter how many how much you practice during the day, and you can still function on the gig. Uh, and I know that that doesn't really help some people that need to get to that point. But that, what that means is like when I was an undergrad, I was practicing six to eight hours a day. So I could still practice four or five hours and have plenty of gas left in the tank to play a gig. Uh, and then the more gigs you play, the more you realize you just have to rely on your air and your technique and your good habits to get you through. You know, um, you have to develop consistent technique. You have to stay relaxed and you have to know how to deal with being tired. Um, you know that when I was in high school and yeah in high school I did you know like most people marching band and drum corps and this stuff and you develop a certain amount of endurance from playing all day you know and I think that's an important part of development as a brass player it's a muscle it's an endurance muscle it's an endurance sport a little bit and you have to put the time in you have to put the time in on the horn if you're only practicing two hours a day you're never going to get to a point where you can play for a few hours practicing and then a gig. But then if you have a gig and you never practice whenever you have a gig, all of a sudden when you have gigs, you're never practicing. So you, it creates this kind of weird situation. So um, you need to be practicing more than how much you would want to be able to play during a day. And uh, that really, really, really means you have to be really confident about your technique and be really solid in your fundamentals. So you have to play long tones, flexibilities. You have to take care of your chops. You have to warm down sometimes. You have to play pedal tones. You have to do false tones. You have to do whisper tones. You have to practice in opposites. Like if you are playing a loud gig one night, then the next day you're going to want to practice soft. You know, you can't do loud all the time. You can't do strong all the time. You can't muscle the trombone. You're never going to win. I'm very, very sorry to tell you that you never will beat the trombone ever. It's a piece of metal and it's going to beat you over the head. Uh, it's ne You're never going to be able to um, successfully uh, beat it. So you, that's what you need to do. You got to, um, you have to take care of your chops. You have to stay relaxed. You have to have great fundamentals. So Ander, I hope that helps you. Um, 
I hope that helps some other people too. It's a common question, especially for college students that are transitioning from being students into the professional world and trying to practice and class and rehearsals. You have to take care of your chops and you have to do it as soon as you can. And so that means staying relaxed, seeking out teachers that can help you with great technique and being aware of your body. Be aware of what's happening. Avoid tension at all costs. I've had many interactions with students and peers and professionals that go through different types of chop problems because of and overplaying, not taking care of themselves, not doing stuff. This is why I'm talking about this. There's a lot of products out there that people push um, with like breathing and like all this stuff. And all to me, all it does is create tension. So tension is the enemy of longevity in uh, brass playing. From what I can tell, the guys that still sound great when they're older always play with a relaxed style for the most part. And it's really about just controlling that air. So, all right, I know that's a long answer to that question. But thank you for being here today. I'm glad to be chatting with you all. Feel free to drop in a few more questions if anybody has anything. I think going back through the stream here to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, let's see, yeah, we got those. Let me go back to the questions from this week. But feel free to drop any in if you're just joining us now. Oops, don't fall phone. All right, we did that, how to absorb the jazz language. Uh, somebody said something in Ukrainian. I don't know how to answer that. Um, but other than that, I think we've answered all of the questions so far. Um, give us give 30 more seconds or so for people to drop in some new questions. Uh, oh, there's one from Joey Lopez. Hi, Joey. He says, whenever I play, even for a little bit, I get a red ring. How can I not put as much pressure when I play? Well, Joey, I get a red ring too, and I don't really push that hard. So I don't necessarily think that the um, ring is the problem. If you are pushing hard, that can be a problem. You need to just practice using less pressure. Uh, you can. There's some complicated ways that you can do that, and there's some simple ways. So the simple way is to... Just put the horn to your face and try not to push. And notice when you're pushing and try to switch over to using your air and focusing your air and changing the vowel sound. We talked about that earlier in the stream. So if you missed it, when this gets posted, go, you should go and check out what we're talking about, changing the vowel shape on the inside of the mouth uh, to match the register that you're trying to play in. Um, utilizing all of those techniques to actually be able to um, not use the pressure, not to push, because the pushing is not going to help you achieve longevity as a brass player. Uh, the second way, as people sometimes do, is putting their trombone on some kind of apparatus. <laughs> and so I don't necessarily recommend this, but people say that they hang it from the ceiling sometimes, and then uh, they just try to like walk up to it and play a note. And if they're not touching the horn with their hands, then they can focus on having no pressure at all. So uh, that's complicated and I don't know how to do that really, but, um, uh, some people talk about doing that. So if you can just think about what that would be like, you know, how little pressure there would be. Um, but I wouldn't worry about the red ring thing. Cause I got a ring. If I play for 30 seconds, there's like a, you know, a ring on my, on my face. So uh, don't worry about that, but just try to play with as little pressure as possible. You have to avoid it and you have to think about the airstream and putting, I like to think about the result that we're looking for rather than the result of like what not to do. Sometimes we focus on what not to do and then we get all in our head about stuff. So I like to focus on what is the solution and focus on the solution and like what should it feel like, not what it should not feel like, if that makes sense. All right, there's another question. I'm gonna switch back and forth. A couple more came in. Uh, Kevin Hornbuckle says, do you like Andrew Williams live streams? Yeah, uh, Andrew's great. Um, I got introduced to him first from by Andy Farber, who was a great tenor player and arranger in New York and was my teacher at Juilliard. He, he was like, yeah, you got to check out Andrew Williams. And he was in New York for a long time and then moved out of the city. And he does some great stuff. He's got great, great vocabulary and phrasing. Amazing. And I'm really glad that he posts those for us to all check out. So if you don't know him, Andrew Williams, go check him out. He's a, a fantastic improviser, trombone player. All right, next qu question from Ashy Dubs. I teach beginning trombonists, but trombone isn't my primary instrument. What are some good beginner standards that sit well on trombone and don't require much slide manipulation? Hmm. Um, I will say you know, that teaching beginners is not my strength. Um, 
I have done it, obviously. Um, let me think. So standards. I mean, stuff that sits. I mean, you got to teach them um, the B flat major scale and get that um, going. E flat major stuff, like one, two, three. You know, I like to use um, not music when I'm teaching those level. I like to use teaching tunes by ear. Uh, like you could te you could teach um, C jam blues. It's just a couple of notes, two notes. Do 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 do. You could just use it. Do it in E flat. You could do it so it's just B flat and first and E flat and third. You could do that. And um, you could um, teach other standards like that. There's a ba 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 da ba ba do de do do. I mean, that's a lot of slide movement, a lot of notes. Sunny moon for two. But I mean, I just, I really think it's important to pick tunes and have them start learning and not just say things like, oh, only they can't be a lot of slide manipulation. I think it's important to just throw them in the deep end because they're going to figure it out. Um, and I think you'll figure it out too. And using your ear and get rid of all these breeze easy and blah, 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 and this and that, especially if you're going to push them into a jazz direction eventually. You, learning tunes by ear to start, you know, Go Talent Roadie or Down by the Riverside or the Saints Go Marching In, all these just like simple tunes. Um, that are in their ear already is super important. Uh, and so I would highly recommend uh, avoiding a method book, but just going to some tunes, simple tunes, and they'll figure it out, you know. Um, I think they will. I really think so. Uh, at first it might be frustrating, but just developing their ear is just so important. You know, what uh, thing? one thing that I'm wondering is that I had a question. It seems like it disappeared. Somebody, I forget who it was, asked the question that they were having trouble finding fourth position and just talking about this like beginning trombonus made me think about that this question had come in and so i'm going to answer it i don't remember who asked it so i'm sorry uh if i forgot your name and ashley i wish i had a better answer for you but check out just jump right in is the is this uh, system of learning these type of tunes uh jump right in it's chris azera that's a bunch of people from eastman where i went uh use this method and it works super super well it works very very well um okay sorry there was a question i started saying oh yeah fifth position fourth position so i do have my trombone here so the, the best way to find fourth position if you are struggling to find fourth position and as a beginning beginning trombonist i could see how that could be a struggle because it's different on every instrument but uh, the best visual that you can use for that is going to be that this part of the slide the top of the slide right this i'm not talking about where your fingers are but this part is going to be in fourth position, like even with the bell, right? So something that happens with beginners a lot is they use the bell to like find positions, but that's not going to help you find fourth position because fourth position is a little further out. So fourth position, you want this part, whatever this top of the outer slide, if you want to be super technical, the top of the outer slide wants to be in line-ish with the bell. That's going to give you a good place to start. But it's important to keep in mind as you start playing more, that all positions are relative and all positions just depend on what instrument you're playing, what key you're in and all this different stuff. So be flexible and try to use your ears to find where that is. And then you gotta just develop the muscle memory of where that is on your instrument. So I forgot who asked that, but I wanted to make sure I got to it because it struck me as a very important question to make sure that I got to in this week's live stream. So thank you for that question. I saw another one here coming in. Uh, from WN Trombone, what mic and filter is that? This is a Rode Podcast Pro microphone. Um, using it for my voice. And then I have another microphone over here that's not plugged in right now. I'll show it to you. It's an Apogee microphone that I use for the trombone. Um, a lot of people on the internet have been um, asking about like what are good trombone mics and stuff like that. And so I've been mentioning those along with all this. Um, and I see your question, uh, J Oma, I O J Oma twenty four. I will get we'll get to you in just a second. Um, microphones. Um, there's some high budget and low budget options. My favorite studio microphone for trombone is the Coles forty thirty eight. Um, I could probably pull it up on YouTube, but it'll probably take too long to do that. I'll get better. I'll get better at that on Facebook soon. But um, Coles forty thirty eight, and then A E A. 
uh, make some good ribbon mics. Royer makes some good ribbon mics, but a rib good ribbon mic sounds really good on trombone. It's nice and dark, but that's the sound I like. I don't like using a Shure like SM57 or 58. I just don't think they sound very good. I mean, they're fine if you need a budget option, you know, but uh, also the RE20 of an electro acoustic or electro, yeah, RE something. RE20. If you search that, you'll find it. Uh, it's also a great budget microphone. The Coles are over a thousand, and the RE20 is like 400. And then um, these Apogee ones sound pretty good, and they're like 100 bucks, 200 bucks. Uh, but my most important uh, idea of a microphone is that it makes it sound like a trombone. And sometimes, uh, sometimes microphones are just too sensitive, and they get all the highs because they're for vocals. You know, it's like. <laughs> You get all that, and then with a brass instrument, you want the core of the sound. You want to you want some of those overtones and highs, but you want the core of the sound. So uh, that's a, a big thing for me. That's what sets one microphone apart from another, in my book, at least. Um, all right, so we have another question here. What are some of your favorite standards? So that changes all the time, but I love stable mates. I like moments notice. Those aren't really standards in my book. Those are uh, jazz tunes. Um, I like, what standards do I like? I'm learning, boo -doo 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 -doo. if I love again, I love, um, if I should lose you, I love, oh, there's so many tunes, I could just list tunes. So in love, it's another Cole Porter. I like, beep, beep, boo -dee, boo -doo -doo -dee -dee. nobody else but me. I like, I could just list tunes forever, so I'm gonna stop. But so in love is a great one. Uh, nobody else but me, I wish I knew. Man, there's so many great standards. So, so many, and I'm not going to keep listing. Another question from Daniel Chandra. Scales or lip slurs? Pick one. Uh, I'm not sure why you would have to pick one, but uh, scales, I guess. If I had to only pick one, you can get more variety from uh, scales than lip slurs, I suppose. Although there's plenty of variety in lip slurs as well. Um, all right, I see another question. Spanish, uh, un poquito. Not very much. Uh, I wish I wish I did. I went to Argentina in 2013 for Tron Bonanza, and I've been saying I'm going to learn Spanish ever since. Maybe now is a good time to kind of get get back to it. So I'm very, very sorry, Pablo. I wish I did. Not very much. So all my content is going to be in English for now. If somebody wants to volunteer to translate it all into Spanish, I am all for it. Uh, if somebody had been doing a few videos in the past, but um, it was it's a lot of work to translate videos, so... They did a few, and then we had to move on from that situation. But I see another question here on uh, Instagram. Where is it? Oh, maybe there's not a new question. I feel like this question thing on Instagram is a little glitchy, so sorry about that. Um, but thank you for being here today. Hi, Pablo. Um, I think that's it for today. We've done a bunch of questions. We're coming up on an hour here, so I'll let you get back to your day. I'll thank you for being here. But I want to let you know about one more thing before I let you go. And that's open until Monday is the Get Set Challenge. If you don't know about what that is, Get Set is a book of etudes. It's on my music stand here. That's why I'm showing it. But uh, there's a free download of an etude, the first etude from the book in this kind of new um, new method that I've kind of come up with that's like taking a Bach-type cello suite-type vibe and putting it into a jazz tune. So we've done, we've done that. Uh, and over all the things you are. And so we're doing a get set challenge where if you upload a video of you doing that, we'll be entered into win either a month of membership into the virtual studio, which is where I post new videos every week, lessons. And then uh, the other thing is free copies of the book. We're going to give away a bunch of those. So if you don't want to make a video, there's also a giveaway. So if you go to my website, Nick Finzer, and click on get set, nickfinzermusic.com, click on get set or find it here. Or you can find it in the link in my bio on Instagram. If you're going to go to Instagram, you can find it on my Facebook page. But I wanted to tell you about it because I want more people to get free stuff. So uh, the get set challenge is running until Monday. So Monday is the, let's see, find the date, 24, 25, 26, 27, right? And it is, after all, trombone week, hence the giveaway, hence the challenge. So take advantage of trombone week and uh, make sure that, you do the get the get set challenge. Um, people are asking about mouthpiece, so I'll address that before we go. And there's another question. I, some of these questions are disappearing. So there's somebody asked me about. Um, so I, somebody asked me about um, the comparison of the mouthpiece I played to a 51D, Shilky 51D, and um, 
I play this. This is a Marcinkowitz 6ES, and some exciting news from Marcinkowitz coming soon, I hope, uh, about that. And um, it's it's comparatively to uh, um, 51D, it's a little wider and a little shallower and much lighter. Um, these mouthpieces are much more lightweight, and I find I can get much more response, uh, better articulation out of a lighter mouthpiece. I had this put onto a heavy blank, no good. And uh, this like this cup and this rim, and it was no good. It was terrible. And uh, but as a as a lightweight mouthpiece, it works really good. I've been playing it for I don't know ten plus years. Six E S is the mouthpiece for those that asked. And uh, Ashley, okay, I see your message, and I will get back to you. Um, awesome. So we had the Get Set Challenge. Post your videos. I can't wait to see them. And uh, check out the Virtual Studio if you're interested. We're relaunching that next week with some exciting new stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to share that next week on the stream. So tune in next week. We'll be back for more Q&A. Pop your questions into uh, DMs or whatever over the week, and we will try to get as many as we can uh, answered during during our live stream. So thanks for being here, Kevin. You're very welcome. Appreciate you being here. And uh, I'll catch you all uh, next time.